This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 403 was produced a day early this week on Wednesday, November 22nd, 2023, due to the American Thanksgiving holiday. I'm Eric Townsend. Tressus chief economist Daniel Lacaye returns as this week's feature interview guest, and I think you're really going to enjoy this interview. We'll discuss everything from recession risk to Eurozone economic weakness and what's causing it to inflation and why Daniel says last week's CPI print wasn't necessarily as bullish as market participants have perceived to monetary aggregate contraction to energy prices and the upcoming OPEC plus meeting this Sunday to what's happened to public sentiment in Europe relative to nuclear energy. And I'm Patrick Ceresna with the Macro Scoreboard week over week as of Wednesday, November 22nd, 2023. The S&P 500 December futures were up 108 basis points, trading at 45.68, continuing its relentless advance as we will take a closer look at that chart and the key technical levels to watch in the post-game segment. The U.S. dollar index down 41 basis points, trading at 103.95. The weakness continues, but many of the cross currencies at key pivots. The January WTI crude oil contract down 133 basis points, trading at 75.77. We'll take a look at that chart in the post game segment. The January RBOB gasoline down 227 basis points, trading at 215. The December gold contract up 143 basis points, trading at 1992, testing that critical 2000 resistance level. Copper up 81 basis points, trading at 375. Uranium up 759 basis points, trading at 8075, printing a new year high as the trend continues to rip higher. The U.S. 10 year Treasury yield down 10 basis points, trading at 443. Yield now 50 basis points off October highs. The key news to watch this week is the flash manufacturing and services PMIs. And next week we have the CB consumer confidence numbers, the core PCE price index, and the ISM manufacturing PMI. This week's feature interview guest is Tress's chief economist, Daniel Lacaye. Eric, why did we invite Daniel back on as a guest this week? Well, Patrick, Daniel is a listener favorite, and we thought it would be timely given that he's based in Europe and a lot of his analysis is focused on the European economy. We had originally thought this time of year was going to be coming into maybe a squeeze or crisis period because of the risk of escalation in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Of course, now what we're seeing is the opposite. The geopolitical wind is blowing in the other direction toward a de-escalation and some sort of uh, peace process or resolution to Ukraine. So we thought it would be timely to get Daniel back for his perspective on Europe and a whole bunch of other stuff. Well, Eric's interview with Daniel Lacaye is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Tress's chief economist and author, Daniel Lacaye. Daniel, it's great to get you back on the show. I want to start with the big picture here of, boy, we've had so many guests on this program telling us, okay, the, the bottom is not in for the bear market. The, the, the hard landing is coming. The recession is just around the corner. But boy, look at this S&P chart. It, it sure seems like the market didn't get the memo. And the recession that everybody's been anticipating for a couple of years now, uh, I, a lot of people say it's already happened, but boy, it's not showing up in the market data. What's going on? Well, I think that uh, there's a combination of looser monetary policy than what many anticipated and an additional element of a more benign view about inflation. I think that basically, uh, if we look at what uh, should have been 2023, Many expected a much larger contraction in money supply in the balance sheet of central banks. If you look at the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, it's still 50% of GDP. 
The same in the case of the, sorry, 30% of GDP in the case of the Federal Reserve, 50% in the case of the ECB. And if you look at, for example, the window of liquidity that the Fed provides, it's uh, gone from 20 trillion to 220 trillion. So we are in a much larger expansionary phase precisely because monetary policy is significantly looser than what people may have expected. On top of that, inflation is coming down slowly, but to a level in which market participants seem to be happy to perceive that there will be a sort of soft landing. I think that the market is happy to believe in the soft landing narrative, despite the weakening of uh, macroeconomic indicators, and is happy to take more risk, assuming that if things get worse on the macro level, central banks will massively inject liquidity and therefore lead to multiple expansion. And I think it's very evident, for example, if we see uh, what the S&P 500 equal weighted is doing. The S&P 500 is, in, is rising. However, it's, it's being led by seven stocks. Uh, if we look at an equal weighted S&P 500, it is actually showing a pretty dire environment that is more consistent with a weak economy, with weak prospects for the economy and persistent inflation. So I think that the market is not so, let's say, optimistic. I think that what the market is more focused on is on the idea that if central bank liquidity injections remain uh, and the policy is accommodative, which it is, and we saw it with the Silicon Valley Bank uh, and regional bank crisis, then uh, it's better to take risk in the long duration uh, equity assets like uh, technology, etc. Daniel, I had to chuckle because the intonation in your voice when you said the market is willing to believe uh, these things kind of led me to believe that maybe Daniel Lacaye is not so inclined to think that uh, this is an all clear from the market. Do you still see the recession risk and hard landing risk or do you think this soft landing narrative is going to come to fruition? Well, let's think of a soft landing and what that means. No, I think that uh, soft landing means that the credit to families is going to continue to decline, that credit to businesses is going to be much more challenging and at much higher cost, and that there will not be a GDP recession, but a significant contraction of the private sector. And that is exactly what is happening. I always say that we are in a private sector recession. The manufacturing sector is in dire conditions. The services sector has been surviving thanks to the uh, consumption of the savings accumulated throughout the past years, but those savings are gone. And if we look at, for example, consumption in real terms, and adjusted for the accumulation of debt, then consumption is really poor. So I think that we are in a private sector recession that is disguising a GDP that is bloated by debt and is bloated by government spending financed with debt. So if you look for, if you look for example, at the United States GDP adjusted for the accumulation of debt, of public debt, then we would be in the worst year uh, since 1930. And so basically what we are living in is in still very loose credit conditions where the challenges for the private sector are being offset by accumulation of debt. And that is very, very dangerous because in 2023, we have not lived the wall of maturities yet. However, the largest number in terms of maturities, the United States government needs to refinance about $7 trillion in the next 12 to 14 months. Uh, that means a lot less liquidity for the private sector at much higher, much higher interest rates. So all of that is going to come back to bite. And uh, we are right now in a private sector recession. 
And I think that 2024 and 2025 are going to be significantly more challenging. The S&P chart was showing a series of lower highs and lower lows through the end of October, but now we've already moved well above that October high, and as we're recording on Tuesday morning, we're just about exactly matching the highs from back in September. Where is this S&P chart headed next? Well, I think that we're likely to see the S&P 500 continue to do very well into the end of the, of the year. The fund flows into ETFs basically tell us that the S&P 500 is likely to perform well into a mm, sort of no new, no bad news is good news environment, both on the inflation front, on the monetary policy front, and on the geopolitical and macro front. So I would be relatively positive about the S&P 500, not necessarily as positive as I would imagine in, uh, for example, the Chinese uh, index or the European index. Let's talk about the European uh, weakness in particular. It seems like the, the European Union has, has really experienced a lot of economic weakness. Uh, many people were attributing that to the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict. It seems like Russia-Ukraine is de-escalating now, but I, I don't necessarily see the European economic data improving. How should we interpret this? Well, I think that the market is swimming in liquidity and at the same time adjusts very rapidly to macroeconomic and to geopolitical risks under the impression that monetary policy will continue to disguise them. And one of the elements that I would consider more dangerous about that is the idea that we can sort of navigate all macroeconomic problems with rate cuts and with liquidity injections. But it's logical on the one hand, because if you think about it, most market participants have only seen rate cuts and liquidity injections. So it's logical that having seen other geopolitical events, most market participants would say, well, yes, that is certainly something that is a, is a challenge, but it's not going to rock the boat of markets because central bank monetary policy and developed economies fiscal policy, which, which both go hand in hand, offset and trump over any other any other impact. So the problem here is that the impact of these geopolitical issues is more prolonged than what people uh, seem to perceive. Many expect this to be a one-year, six-month uh, problem. However, if we look at the the reality of history, what we see is that these problems continue for um, for quite some time, generating important uh, ramifications in the real economy. And those ramifications include, obviously, uh, the impact on trade, where trade is likely to continue to be weak, where impact on manufacturing, which is very, very evident, and impact on uh, potential economic growth because protectionism, uh, sanctions, all these side effects of geopolitical tensions uh, do have a very significant impact on growth and on real disposable income. So if we, if we look at what has happened in geopolitical terms globally, basically we are seeing almost a slowly moving process in which the economy is going back to pre-globalization mode in which tensions between large uh, economies are rising, in which those tensions are not just not improving, but actually basically keeping the situation negative for a prolonged period of time, as we are seeing with the so many people had a view that the tariffs uh, from the United States to China would be lifted when the new administration joined, didn't happen. 
So I think that all those factors are quite important and they erode economic growth, they erode trade, they have a very significant negative impact on productivity growth, which means lower wage growth. And that is very evident in the United States, where despite significantly more positive uh, figures of, for example, job creation than what uh, some expected, the reality is that with such low level of unemployment, the United States has negative real wage growth, which is a reflection of the very poor productivity growth and these sort of deglobalization factors that are worsening the conditions for the average consumer. Let's come back to the topic of inflation and particularly the market reaction to last week's CPI print. You know, when I looked at the, the, the reaction on the tape, I thought, oh my gosh, CPI must have come in just massively below expectations. And then I looked at the data, it was a 0.1% miss on consensus expectations. Seems to have started this, this grand party that hasn't stopped. Am I missing something? I think you're not missing anything. I think that people want to see positive things and things that are not particularly good. <laughs> I mean, just to well, think- Has anybody questioned that maybe the reason inflation is coming down is that the hard landing that some people have predicted might actually be just around the corner? Precisely. I think that this is this is the problem with many market participants is that Many think that inflation is going to come down magically without any contraction in the economy. No? And obviously, it doesn't happen. If we look at the negatives of the CPI print, for me, they are very evident. First, prices are not falling. Prices continue to rise, albeit at a lower pace. Second, if you extract those that are replaceable goods and services, if you look at the non-replaceable goods, those continue to be rising significantly above inflation, uh, the CPI print. Therefore, the uh, purchasing power of salaries and deposits is certainly weakening. But also, as you very well mentioned, this soft landing myth of, hey, we're going to see inflation going down to 2% and at the same time economic growth with low employment, unemployment and with real wage growth, that is not going to happen. It's impossible. There is, I've written extensively about the myth of the soft landing. Once you have created such an incredible imbalance like the one that central banks created in 2020, it may take a couple of years to sort of show the reality of what the economic impact is but it's not just inflation it's just is that there's it's impossible to reduce inflation to 2% without seeing a very significant contraction in aggregate demand and when governments are not reducing expenditure but increasing That means that the reduction in aggregate demand can only come from the private sector, families and businesses. Therefore, the soft landing that the Fed is trying to engineer is actually a hard landing for business and families because governments don't seem to get (laughs) the memo of hiking rates and contracting monetary, monetary aggregates. So, Absolutely, Eric. What you're saying makes all the sense because there is absolutely no way in which these individual prices are going to come down to pre-pandemic levels without a very significant hard landing. And I come back to the point that, as you very well mentioned, CPI print was literally – I mean, it's an 0.1% below consensus is is – means absolutely nothing when we see, for example, how the CPI is calculated and how many of the prices are not just not uh, falling, but actually they continue to rise well above that CPI print. Daniel, you briefly mentioned contracting monetary aggregates. Give me a little bit more perspective on that. Well, if you look at the latest figures, 
that the Federal Reserve publishes, the narrow money M1 deposits, uh, money in circulation and deposits, has fallen from 20 trillion to uh, 18 trillion. And if you look at the M2, uh, which is a broader money supply aggregate, it's showing also a quite a significant contraction. So those two are basically showing that this is more than a soft landing because credit deposits, money in circulation is falling and falling very, very rapidly. And that's why many of the of the analysts that look at monetary aggregates are extremely concerned that the Fed doesn't pay attention to these indicators because the figures that the Fed looks at, GDP and unemployment, are lagging indicators. They're also very aggregated indicators. GDP can be bloated by government spending and by massive increases in debt. Unemployment may be low, but labor participation rate and unemployment to population rates both are below pre-pandemic levels. And real wage growth is actually negative. So that added to the fact that credit to families, credit to businesses, deposits and money in circulation is all of those things are contracting quite rapidly. But at the same time, and this is an important factor, the window of liquidity of the Federal Reserve, where banks are trying to get credit to, from their assets in, uh, in sovereign bonds, etc., the window of liquidity has gone from 20 trillion to 220. So the situation in the economy is worsening very rapidly, and the credit system is being kept afloat by this window liquidity uh, window of the Federal Reserve. All of those factors show why the S&P 500 <laughs> continues to be strong despite a very dangerous and rapidly deteriorating economic environment when we look at leading indicators. These monetary aggregate declines are not going to be shown in the fourth quarter GDP because it's a lagging indicator and because the quarterly GDP also has a lagging effect from the previous figure. But it is going to come in 2024 and very, very significantly uh, in a number of the indicators and particularly, I think, in those of investment and consumption. So, Daniel, it sounds to me like you're saying the rest of 2023 is likely to be an uphill trip for markets, but maybe start to use some caution or even put some hedges on as we get into January. Is that right? I would do that basically because all of the things that are suggesting that you should be long risk into the end of the year are predicated on the view that no news is good news. We're not going to receive very significant news on inflation, not very significant news on monetary policy. And the earnings season is so far pretty much discounted. However, 2024 is going to be a much more challenging year because multiple expansion is already behind you. Because all of those effects of the decline in monetary aggregates are going to start to build up in the economy. And we are going to face the previously mentioned wall of maturities, which is one of the biggest problems to me to face from the side of market participants. We need to understand that the $7 trillion of debt that the United States government needs to refinance will be refinanced, absolutely. But that means much less liquidity for markets and for credit in general. Therefore, 2024 is going to be another year of monetary contraction for the private sector. And we may see a much more challenging environment for multiple expansion in those seven, eight stocks that lead the S&P 500. 
because it is not so much about the uh, environment of earnings of these companies as the environment of interest rates and of inflation. If the CPI print of December starts to show that the base effect stops working and at the same time that some of the of the prices in energy components etc reverse the process that we have seen in the past two months then the market will probably get less i would say bullish about the idea of massive rate cuts in 2024 so from today to the end of the year, the market is going to continue to be, uh, let's say, happy about the idea of the inverted uh, curve of rates into 2024 with massive rate cuts between, between June and December. But if you look at what happened in the market this year, we are likely to see something similar, which is that as we move from January to June, the prospect of new and following rate cuts is likely to be different, is i.e. that the market will start to price in less rate cuts and probably no rate cuts if inflation remains persistent. Because as I mentioned before, monetary aggregates are coming down, which means that inflation year on year is going to continue to decline into this the end of this year. But liquidity injections in the economy continue to be very aggressive. That's why the CPI print is not bullish, is actually bearish. Why? Because if you look at monetary aggregates, the CPI print today should be between 1.8 to 2%, not 3.1 to 3.2%. Daniel, let's move on to a subject you and I both follow very closely, which is energy prices. Uh, a few months ago, I was very concerned that as we headed into the winter, there was a risk that if the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict were to escalate, that Putin might weaponize oil prices. Well, it seems like, if anything, we're going the other direction, that both the European Union and the United States are backing away from encouraging uh, any further escalation of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So it seems like that settling down. The Israel-Gaza conflict, boy, when we had Lindsey Graham on uh, television, you know, calling for the, the destruction of all of Iran's oil production assets, uh, I thought, boy, we really need to be concerned about a major price escalation in oil coming out of that conflict. And uh, as Dr. Anas Alhaji predicted on this show, I was wrong on that one. We seem to be going the other direction, recently putting in a low. Now, as we come into speculation that OPEC Plus might cut at their coming meeting on Sunday, uh, we're getting a little bit of a rally in the market, but very depressed energy prices at a time I wasn't expecting it. What do you make of all this? Number one is that the manufacturing, the industrial complex globally is very weak. So demand growth is not at all what people uh, would have expected in an environment of uh, global GDP growth of uh, 3%. I think that that's the first. The second is that supply is responding in a much more bullish, that is for consumers or bearish for price, way than initially expected. For example, I think that very few people expected the United States to reach record levels of oil production in 2023, and that has happened. No? So record production from the United States, Iran production reaching China, which is the marginal buyer of oil, uh, natural gas, and coal, and therefore the one that tends to lead prices. And the Chinese economy is not booming as many predicted with the uh, reopening. So a number of supply and demand factors are sort of supporting a price that, although it's not bad, uh, because if you look at the, the, the prices of, of oil in particular, most of the prices are showing that there is a very, very stubborn support level 
justified by all of the things that you mentioned, uh, challenges on the geopolitical front, challenges on the supply front. Absolutely. But the weakness of the demand side added to the monetary factor, I think, are very important. The fact that the Federal Reserve continues to keep rates makes it more challenging in the energy complex to take margin calls, to finance long positions, etc. All of those factors put a lid on oil prices and energy prices. In the case of natural gas in Europe and the Ukraine problem, that challenge remains. However, the reality, and I, I'm going to the Netherlands very soon and I've just been traveling all around Europe, the reality is that the prospects of a very mild winter are also keeping gas prices, natural gas prices, depressed. So, I think it's a combination of weak demand, weather conditions, Chinese economy weaker than expected, and at the same time, supply being more ample than what one would have imagined, considering how I was reading the other day, for example, uh, how the supply from Iran to China had risen very, very significantly, and that increased was putting a lid on the marginal buyer of Brent, WTI, China, but also putting a lid on price uh, to offset the, the challenges on the geopolitical front. OPEC Plus meets this coming Sunday, November 26th. More and more people on Twitter and uh, in the marketplace are starting to speculate about what they are describing as a weaponization of oil prices by some of the Arab states who are OPEC members. Uh, I personally disagree strongly with that characterization of weaponization. But uh, what do you expect to see? Do you, do you think this is weaponization? Do you think it's something else that might motivate a cut? And do you expect any policy change? change from OPEC on this coming meeting. I, I also strongly disagree with the concept of weaponization of oil prices because it's implying a view that OPEC plus has a policy that goes against its customers, which makes absolutely no sense. And if you follow the policy of OPEC producers in the past 40 years, it is. It has nothing to do with that concept of weaponization. I think that what the OPEC Plus members are likely to react to is the weakness of global demand. Let's see their estimates of global demand growth, which was already trimmed and is likely to be trimmed yet again and their view of the balance of the market. I think that they're more likely to react to an imbalance in the market, whether there is excess supply, and uh, than to just simply try to bring oil prices up because it, it makes no sense from a strategy to try to drive prices much higher, which would create a recession or a big crisis in developed economies and accelerate the transition to other technologies. I think that uh, the the policy of OPEC, I've had the, the pleasure of attending five OPEC meetings in my life, and, and the policy of OPEC is always very accommodative to the reality of what the customer base is demanding. Not what we as traders may think or may want, but what the reality of supply and demand is. And, and if you think about the reactions of OPEC, they are never reactions to try to pump prices artificially, but to balance the market in periods in which the demand side is weaker or the supply side is way too, too robust. So I think that they will make a calculation. I think that they will come up with a view that demand is slightly worse than they expected and that supply, particularly non-OPEC supply, was underestimated by them and then adjust. But I don't expect 
let's say, weaponization in any shape or form. I think that they know that there's a price at which demand growth continues to be adequate. And they're trying to sort of, they're trying to work like, like the Fed or like uh, the ECB with monetary liquidity. They're trying, they're not trying to destroy the, the market. They're trying to sort of navigate it. And obviously they can make mistakes, but I don't see in any shape or form that concept of weaponization. Let's also remember in any case that OPEC plus, including Russia, means about a little bit more than 40% of the overall production of the market. But in terms of exports, it is significantly lower. So a lot of what they do is not just to the market, but to themselves. And I think that that is an important, uh, an important driver is attending their own demand growth. And if we look at the last years, Russia, for example, is going to export around four and a half million barrels a day. Well, obviously, out of the 10 million that they produce, that four and a half million is going to generate an important balance in the market, but it's not necessarily going to drive prices significantly higher or significantly lower. So I think that they will be they will be quite prudent. I, I, I always look at uh, OPEC meetings with less of a surprise factor and more of a prudent approach to a weakening environment of global demand. It's so refreshing, Daniel, to hear someone else, there aren't many voices, uh, share my opinion that this is absolutely not about weaponization. And I actually think the risk is on the other side. In other words, I think OPEC Plus should cut production, not just because of the supply demand f uh, factors that you just described, but also because right now we have fairly limited spare capacity in the system. I had Rory Johnson on uh, recently. He estimates that we've got only about 3 million barrels of spare capacity. We've got Lindsey Graham, you know, making threats of knocking 3 million barrels of, of uh, capacity in Iran permanently offline. Uh, it seems to me that we have uh, OPEC, I think, has a responsibility here in their role in managing the market to look at the geopolitical situation and say, we need to have more spare capacity to be ready for what might happen next with these various different escalating geopolitical conflicts around the world. What I fear is that their desire not to be perceived, because I think the, the other Arab countries other than Iran very much do not want to be perceived as encouraging any kind of escalation of this uh, Israel-Gaza conflict. Uh, I'm afraid that they might shy away from a cut they ought to make because they don't want to be perceived as weaponizing. And I think that would be a tragedy if it happens. I think it's a very, very good point. The importance of having ample spare capacity in an environment of geopolitical concerns is many times wrongly perceived by market participants and certainly by politicians. Many think that it's aiming to artificially tighten the market. No, it's to have enough spare capacity. And spare capacity is a key driver of what OPEC is all about, which is to be the central bank of oil. No, I think that because of what you just mentioned, which is absolutely essential, is the fear of looking like you are taking actions against your customers is a very important driver of why OPEC is likely to make a decision that is not, uh, let's say, that is, that is very flexible. Hmm? So if they talk of supply cuts, it is likely going to be on the basis of demand weakening further. So um, I believe that they will not announce a supply cut I believe that they will announce the likelihood of a supply cut, sort of similar to what the Fed does when it says, and by the way, we will hike rates in 2023 and all that. So I think it's very, very unlikely that they implement measures immediately. There is also an important factor 
in terms of price here. I mentioned the increase of supply from Iran to China. That is depressing the average OPEC basket price because obviously those are long-term contracts. They're not made at spot prices that we look in the screen, etc. So what we are seeing is that there are more long-term contracts being created between suppliers and consumers, and that the marginal driver of price, which used to be China, is becoming less of a spot buyer. So that ultimately keeps a lid on how prices may rise. I also think that uh, the fact that in an environment of prices the way that they are today, the United States has reached a record level of production, something that a lot of people find counterintuitive because many expected last year that 2023 and 2024 would be very poor years of production from from US independent producers so all those things in my in in my opinion sort of put a lid on how much oil prices can can rise and that from the opec perspective is also making things better in terms of the demand growth that they require. Daniel, I want to move on to a changing sentiment globally around nuclear energy, which I'm very excited about. I'm I'm so excited that finally people are recognizing that uh, we've been missing the boat for 50 years. And I, I think very strongly that nuclear energy is the way to go. We need a nuclear renaissance. What really confuses me, though, is the mindset or the sentiment of the public in Europe specifically. Uh, I know from my own personal travels in Europe, I always found the German people to be probably the least emotional and the most focused on logic and reason. They've, they've got engineering and science just deeply embedded into their culture. Yet, well, that was in the 80s that I used to travel to Europe uh, frequently. I don't know if something changed in Germany, but it seems to me they just had their lifeline of energy supply into their country, the the Nord Stream pipeline, blown up in an act of state-sponsored terrorism that nobody seems to be willing to admit uh, having perpetrated. And they're in a desperate situation of really needing every drop of energy they can get. And they're still having a very heated public debate where a lot of people are pushing very hard to decommission all of the remaining perfectly good nuclear plants that they have in operation at a time when they're actually resorting in a very environmentally conscious country to building new coal fired electric plants. I mean, this just seems crazy to me. Has has something changed in German culture? Have they have they gone from being unemotional to hyper emotional? What what has happened? I find it so shocking that it's it's difficult to believe that it is actually happening. I think about what has happened in in Germany is that is a completely emotional and illogical decision about nuclear predicated on the on the fear of accidents that had absolutely nothing to do with nuclear energy to start with as the case of Fukushima and nothing to do with the European type of nuclear energy as in the case of the accident in Siberia no many many decades ago What is the problem here? The problem is that in Germany, there is a very strong lobby against nuclear no matter what. And the problem is even worse when you think that in the middle of the biggest energy crisis that Germany has lived with the supply of Russian gas being stopped and all of the sanctions and all those things, etc. I find it amazing that the government, instead of keeping those nuclear plants that remained available, decided to continue with the decommission, which shows, again, what politicians do. Politicians don't solve problems. They they double down on the bet that created the problem in the first place. And I find it interesting 
because while we see this, you've just mentioned the most important part is that today in the energy mix in Germany, about 40% is coal. 40% is coal. It is so incredible coal and natural gas that they have to split in the in the pie chart coal and lignite which is the same for the people that are listening to us and i find it so hypocritical from the green party and from the green defenders that they say absolutely nothing about this increase in coal consumption but they continue to fight against nuclear when at the same time in the european union France continues to produce uh, about 70% of its electricity from nuclear energy. And more importantly, if you're a German citizen, you have literally close to the border 57 nuclear reactors in France and in the neighboring countries. Why on earth decide to destroy a perfectly viable source of energy that is essential for the decarbonization process that the European Union is trying to achieve. There is absolutely no way that the energy transition is achieved successfully without nuclear and without natural gas. Yet, where governments seem to shoot themselves in the foot. And in the case of Germany, it is destroying the competitiveness of the industry. The industry in Germany is based on, obviously, very strong engineering, very strong commitment to uh, just-in-time processes, but it is also based on the pillar of affordable energy. And affordable energy is not a pillar anymore of the, of the, of the German industry. And they decide to shut down the remaining nuclear terminals without a viable alternative. Because let's remember that after 200 billion euro, almost uh, 200 billion dollars of subsidies, in what we have seen in, in Germany is that the re reliability of the energy mix has worsened that the volatility of the energy mix is very aggressive because obviously uh, wind and solar are intermittent and volatile. And at the same time, they have worsened their, competitives, their competitiveness of their industry. So it's, it's extremely concerning. But it shows that when politicians decide one thing, they do it regardless of the consequences. Tell me a little bit about the changing sentiment in France, because at least to my understanding, let's say 10 years ago, France was uh, just an unquestioned leader in nuclear, not just in what they were doing, getting to 70% of their electricity being generated from nuclear, which is fantastic. But it was also, at least as I understood it, kind of a public pride issue in France. The, the public understood that they had clean, safe nuclear energy. They were proud of that fact. And at least as I understood it, French environmentalists were much more likely than environmentalists in other countries to have a more level-headed, informed view and say, no, actually, we're really leading the world in what we're doing in France with nuclear. It is the green way to go. It is the smarter way to go. You know, the rest of the world ought to follow us. Now it seems like the public sentiment is very strongly, or there's a growing anti-nuclear sentiment at the very time when, because of energy transition and concerns about climate change, it should be the opposite. It is, it is truly incredible, but it is true. There is a rising... What do you think is driving that? Is it, is it misinformation? Uh, why would the... Uh, it's ideology. It has absolutely nothing to do with information. One of the things that I found always very ironic about the European Union is that uh, up until very, very recently, nuclear energy was considered as positive and even left-wing in in a country like France, while it was considered negative and right-wing in a country like Spain. And it was basically all of this propaganda that is built upon energy. The problem in the European Union is that energy policy is not driven by logic. Energy policy is driven by ideology. And ideology has dictated that the only alternative is wind and solar, which makes absolutely no sense from the perspective of energy independence, because 
one becomes more dependent on China because of rare earths, because of all of the uh, requirements of, of uh, metals and, and uh, the different uh, components of uh, renewable energy, which basically around 50% come from mining and from China. But it's basically an ideological view that the only thing that is green is wind and solar. And energy policy needs to be built upon the pillars of, obviously, security of supply, affordability and competitiveness, and uh, environmental support, obviously. But when they think that the only environmental technology is uh, the only environmental technologies are wind and solar, they're making a huge mistake because they're volatile, because they're intermittent, and because the the basic concept of what an energy policy, a competitive energy policy needs to be, are completely forgotten. So what has happened in France is that the Socialist Party probably remember that the Social Democrat sort of center-left party basically imploded. And now the left is extreme left. Hmm? The left, basically, the Mélenchon party is uh, very, very uh, radical. And these uh, groups are basically the same groups that implemented the idea and that uh, supported the idea that nuclear is extremely negative. They do it in Spain, they do it in Italy, they do it in Germany, and they're doing it in France. So there has been a shift in the perception of nuclear from what you perfectly described as national pride, which was very much in line with the view of the French Social Democrat Party of, you know, sort of strategic sector that they are leading, not just from the perspective of supply, but also in technology with the strong uh, engineering companies in nuclear, etc. It's gone from shifting to from that national pride to uh, an attack on nuclear because the political debate has radicalized quite significantly. And the polarization of the, of the debate on energy in France is shocking to me. The extreme right, the National Front, is very pro-nuclear, very pro-fossil fuels as well. But the radical left is only focused on wind and solar. And they think that France would be equally competitive and equally strong in terms of energy supply with only uh, wind and solar until you explain to them how are you going to get the copper, the aluminum, and all of the rare earths that are required for that renewable uh, rollout. But they don't talk about that. Well, if you've succeeded in explaining that to them, you're a better explainer than I am. Uh, Daniel, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Before I let you go, tell us a little bit more about what you do at Tresses. You're an uh, author. Uh, how can people follow your work and so forth? Uh, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Obviously, you can follow me on Twitter. I have a, an English account. Uh, uh, also on YouTube, I have my Daniel Lacaille in English YouTube channel. And I'm the chief economist at Tresses. I also manage one of the fund, uh, one of the funds that we have. And I'm also a professor of uh, global economics and an author of four books, Escape from the Central Bank Trap, the Energy World is Flat, which focuses on these things that we have been discussing, life in the financial markets, and freedom or equality. Patrick Ceresna, Nick Galarnik, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Energy Transition Crisis, my new video documentary series about energy transition, has finally been released, and anyone can watch it for free at energytransitioncrisis.org. The series explains exactly what it's really going to take to break humanity's addiction to fossil fuels and why it will take longer and cost more than almost anyone realizes. And I'd like to think the three episodes on nuclear energy are among the most detailed on YouTube. This is a passion project for me, and there's no profit motive, no revenue, and therefore, no budget other than donations. 
I'd really appreciate your help promoting the series. Things you can do to help include subscribing to the Energy Crisis Doc YouTube channel, liking every episode, posting comments on YouTube, and posting links to your favorite episodes on social media. If you don't have time to do those things, there's also a donations page at energytransitioncrisis.org. The money does not go to me. 100% of it will be spent on YouTube and other social media advertising to promote the series. Thanks in advance for your help. Now let's get back to the show and Patrick's post-game chart deck. Now back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Daniel back on the show. And joining us again in the post game is Nick Galarnik. Now let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post game chart deck in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, that means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over Daniel's picture saying, looking for the downloads. Eric, let's start with crude oil. Due to releasing the show a day early this week because of the American holiday, we don't have any EIA inventory data to share with our listeners this week. API, that's the private inventory service, reported a very large crude oil build of over 9 million barrels, but that was offset by large product draws. But the driver behind the rally we've seen in oil prices this week has entirely been expectations around OPEC Plus meeting on Sunday. And what I think is, frankly, some nonsensical rhetoric about weaponization of oil prices by Arab states. As I said in the feature interview, OPEC Plus should cut production because that's the prudent and responsible thing for them to do in the face of rising geopolitical risks and insufficient spare capacity to respond to a true geopolitical crisis should one arise. The reason I'm concerned that they might not cut production is that they have a strong incentive, per Dr. Anas Alhaji's arguments a few weeks ago here on Macro Voices, they have a strong incentive not to be perceived as weaponizing prices. And that's the nonsensical conclusion that Western analysts would reach if they were to do the right thing and cut production in the course of their normal function of managing the market for prudent and responsible reasons. Thin liquidity on Friday could open the door to a big move in either direction if there's news. In the case of a big move up on weaponization fears going into the weekend in Sunday's OPEC Plus meeting, I'd be inclined to fade any move higher into the close, especially if it's brought on by geopolitical news from the Israel-Gaza conflict. So Eric, on page two, I have that chart on crude and uh, with that 50 day moving average, it's so clear that uh, we are no longer even just in a retracement, but uh, some very deep reversion back to the summer lows. The bigger question in my mind, are we going to see testing down under $70 for a full retesting of that support line, or are we going to start seeing oil start to base here? What is clear is with this type of a, a deep breakdown, in my mind, it's going to take a basing formation to once again turn this trend bullish. At best, in my mind, is we're going to be far more trade range bound for the rest of the year, and it will take a, a base into uh, the start of next year to potentially see uh, a more meaningful new trend emerge. Nonetheless, let's move on to equities. I want to get Nick involved in this conversation. Nick, uh, let's start off just by talking about the levels you're looking on on the S&P 500. Yeah, Patrick, happy Thanksgiving. And uh, let's get into it. So the spot price right now on SPX is approximately 4550. We have a call wall above at 4600, just below that year high, uh, 4609 area. We have a put wall below at 4,400, and the implied move for the, for the December 15th OPEX is plus minus 100 points. Therefore, the upper expected move is 46.50, and the lower expected move is 44.50. Key resistance above is at 4,600, where the call wall is, and key support is below at 4,500. Now, given this sharp rally, which has caught in a lot of people up, uh, off guard, I'm inclined to think we see a pullback. I think the 4450 area would be a good target in the next couple of weeks. And um, right now I'm, I'm pretty bearish short term, but again, I do think we see that year end rally perhaps to 4650. What are your thoughts? 
Oh, you know what? Uh, that's not far off from uh, my thinking as well. The only issue I have with it is uh, that it seems to be an increasingly consensus view, and rarely does the market do what everyone uh, views as the uh, most obvious move. With that said, we are definitely trading at the summer highs, and that is uh, usually a point of overhead resistance. It is a, a typical place to see that retracement. The 50-day moving average lies a little bit lower than your number around 4,400. So 100 to 150 point pullback is shouldn't surprise anybody. But the uh, view really should be that uh, this is no longer just a bear market rally bounce, but rather a trend. And um, that means that uh, this may uh, remain in the upper boundaries of these uh, area for the rest of the year. And the curious question is, uh, could we see a rally that goes all the way back to the 2021 high near 4,800? As improbable as I think it is, uh, it really uh, is the path of of least resistance. It'll be interesting to see whether the bulls can pull it off. The the part for me, though, inevitably, we're still going to see some sort of an economic recession. We're going to see at some point corporate earnings get impacted. And at some point, it's going to lead uh, to some sort of a bear market decline. But clearly, 2023 was not the year that it was all beginning. And so we're going to have to see where this trend finishes off and then uh, how it transitions into the new year. Let's uh, move on to the NASDAQ here. And uh, what, what levels are you watching on the queue? Spot price right now on the queues is approximately 390. We have a call wall above at 400 and a put wall below at 380. Now, the implied move for the December 15th monthly OPEX is plus minus 12 points. Thus, the upper potential move would be 402, just below the all time highs at 408, 409. And the lower potential move would be at 378, which is just below that key support area of 380. Right now, resistance above is at 400, which is only about 10 points from the current price. Uh, again, uh, NVIDIA reported earnings last night, solid report for sure, but the valuation I think is very stretched. And I think big tech, given how far it's run in the last couple of weeks, has a bit of cooling off to do as well. So I'm more inclined to look at the small caps in the form of IWM. I do like it toward around 185, 190, but I'm not that bullish right now on big tech. I think that if anything does fall, it'll be the big tech names. Um, you know, Google, Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, they've all had substantial runs and the valuations I think are, are very, very stretched. And uh, I, I'm not very bullish on those names right now at all. Well, you know, in principle, uh, I uh, want to agree with you. The one thing in my mind, though, is, is the trend uh, and the money flow has been chasing these uh, MAG7 stocks. And until I see them truly run out of momentum and start to roll over more decisively, will I kind of uh, put more uh, action toward that uh, idea? To me, uh, right now, they've been the leadership. And one of the biggest trades is going to be later in December or January when we potentially see that leadership uh, shift. Maybe it's going to be the bond proxy uh, beaten down defensive sector that starts getting flows and we see distribution in the MAG-7 and maybe that's going to make the indices very heavy. But that's early speculation and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be looking for more technical signs when that kind of a thesis actually starts to emerge. Well, what I want to move on here with uh, Nick is uh, volatility index on page six. And uh, boy, did vol conditions collapse. Like I thought it would take us in deep into the holidays to see VIX on a 12 handle. And uh, yet here we are after a huge rip in the markets and volatility just imploded. While uh, you can talk about the fact that this was where the year lows have been and that resistance can hold, uh, with a speed and velocity, which we got down here, it's certainly asking the big question as to whether we might see an 11 handle on the VIX in the weeks to come. How do you look at the volatility here? So right now with the VIX at approximately 12, the expected broad market moves each day, top to bottom, are about 0.75%. Looking at the options on SPX, which the VIX is predicated upon, it's very interesting because the SPX call options are pretty much pricing in a perfection move to the upside. So uh, what I mean by that is that if you're bullish right now and you're buying call options on SPX, you need basically an excessive move to the upside in order to win because calls are priced so highly right now. Conversely, puts are much, much cheaper than they usually are because 
a lot of people are not chasing puts in the form of insurance right now, which is very, very interesting. But as we've seen in the past, the VIX can pop very, very fast on exogenous events. And so I expect that in the next couple of months, we'll see a pop towards 16 again. I don't know what the catalyst will be, but I think right now it's very prudent to perhaps go long options on longer dates, uh, out of the money put spreads perhaps, or call spreads if you're bullish. And uh, selling premium right now is not very prudent because premiums are very, very low on larger than expected moves intraday. For example, a 1% move up or down, that'll burn most option premium sellers. You know, what's interesting, Nick, uh, is, is that uh, as you say that I was looking at one year volatility and we're right down to the bottom end of the range where we were in the summer again. Uh, we have three month vol ranges down to the 15 handle. Like it really is uh, a complete collapse of volatility right across the board. This isn't just like uh, one month seasonal volatility that is as narrow as it is. It'd be really interesting to see how it plays out. Now, moving on to page seven, we have the US dollar index. Eric, what are your thoughts here? We see a nice new downsloping price channel setting up on the dollar index. We just touched the bottom of that price channel, the channel support level, as we touched uh, or almost touched 103 on the dollar index. We're bouncing predictably here, but as long as we stay uh, below 104 spot 50 or so, we're still in that steeply downsloping price channel. And it's just a question of how much lower we go before we see a change here. I don't have a downside target. Curious to get your views. You know, the 105 level was uh, important. It was where a lot of resistance lied in the first and second quarters of the year. But uh, what is interesting is, is that uh, the euro and uh, even the yen have approached some key retracement zones. And uh, what we're seeing here is that this pullback, if the dollar pullback is just a retracement, should actually uh, start to put in some lows right around here. To me, uh, very similar to the key levels when we were in the 80s on crude oil, It was a, it's the crossroad where it's either a pullback in a primary trend higher or it's a, a, a full reversion and going to test previous lows. And I think the dollar is exactly at that inflection point. And so it, if the bulls can hold the line around this 104 and trade it back to 105 and start to consolidate it here, then a rising dollar is still not off the table. But it is definitely a very key moment in the dollar. Now, moving on to page eight, we have the gold futures chart. What are you guys thinking here? The gold chart looks great with gold holding over the short term moving averages on a closing basis. The next hurdle is closing over the October high at 2020 on the December contract. If we can achieve that, the next targets higher are first new all time highs at 2085 and then a measured move target all the way up to 2140. That's 2140. Some observers see the four-day ceasefire in the Israel-Gaza conflict that was just negotiated by Qatar as a sign of de-escalation and therefore potentially a bearish impulse for gold. But I don't see it that way. To my understanding, Israel has reluctantly agreed to this ceasefire because of international pressure to focus on hostage release. Once the hostages are released and the ceasefire is over, I expect the conflict to fully re-escalate, and that may provide the catalyst needed to break above 2020. Once we make that break, the next stop should be 2085. So let's keep a close eye on the chart, but if we can get above 2020, I think this is a very bullish setup. Generally, I agree with the, what you're saying there, Eric. Overall, uh, gold is in a primary trend uh, higher, especially if you look on the weekly and monthly charts. Uh, even on the monthly charts, we're trading right along the very key levels of the bodies of all the candles. But uh, this 2000 level is to me also a very psychological level because uh, if gold sustains above 2000 on any uh, long-term basis, uh, then it really puts in motion the trends where at this time around, I seriously doubt the previous highs around 2080, 85 are going to hold. I uh, think this is a very important moment to see whether or not the bulls can uh, break this out and let it run. I think you use the 2000 level as a clean pivot uh, for whether the trend is broken out. 
On page nine, I have the U.S. government 10-year bond yields, and uh, it, it really does look like that 5% mark the uh, blow-off top in the yields. Now, what will be really interesting is we see these uh, weaker inflation prints, Whether what uh, the next rally in the yields will look like. If we see that uh, um, the bond bears can't get the bonds back down to the lows or the yields back up to 5%, that might put in uh, a short to intermediate high in yields, which uh, would be huge because that would uh, really put in play all of these bond proxy assets that uh, were under pressure with the rising interest rates. It's uh, certainly something I'm watching very closely. And finally, on page 10, I wanted to touch on the uh, uranium chart. For the purposes here, I put on the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust but this trend is relentless. Higher highs, higher lows. We continue to see uh, now uranium above $80 on the U308. It is a, a trend that is uh, dominant. And uh, while it seems overbought, it's getting a lot of attention in a very small market. And it'll be interesting to see whether flows can continue this and turn it almost into a bubblish rise. Uh, watching uranium is key. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck, or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's Research Roundup. Well, in this week's Research Roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview and the chart book that we just discussed in the post game, including a number of links to articles that we found interesting. So you're going to find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that is Eric spelled with a K, and follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Serezna, and myself, thanks for listening, and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.